Tonight, Dr. Krasniewski will be speaking to us about why Latin is the right language for Roman Catholic worship. Please help me in welcoming him. Thank you, Michael. Wonderful. So can you hear me all right everywhere? Excellent. The question of the language in which a Christian liturgy should be conducted is a much more complicated question than most people realize at first glance. To the extent that we have been brainwashed by rationalism, we tend to assume that the only purpose of speaking, of using words at all, is to communicate ideas between people. Language has a utilitarian function. This is its only justification. Of course, it is true that we use words to convey ideas to one another. That's the whole point of a lecture, like tonight's. But language has loftier functions. For example, poetry pays attention to the beauty and sound and associations and intricate inner meanings of language. It is meant as a testimony to and a revelation of something of the mystery of being. That is why poetry is often harder to grasp, but more rewarding when understood. And in the best poetry, always contains some element of the ineffable or inexpressible, the reaching toward a thought or a vision or an experience that cannot be fully captured in words. Or consider nursery rhymes, lullabies, and nonsense songs. These are sung for fun or to little children to entertain them or to help them fall asleep. The communication of a definite meaning is not the point. It is about togetherness, comfort, reassurance, simple delight. Language here becomes more a vehicle of sentiment and feeling. Or consider prayers offered by the church to God. That's going to be our main topic. It is a good thing for the one offering the prayer to understand what he is saying. But since the prayer is from the church to God, the purpose of it is not human comprehension, as if that is the goal, but humbly and efficaciously supplicating God. He, or his grace and blessing, is the purpose of the prayer. And so what matters most is the objective content, the goodness of the prayer itself, not so much whether those saying it or those hearing it fully grasp its meaning. In his outstanding book, The Traditional Mass, History, Form, and Theology of the Classical Roman Rite, which I highly recommend, uh, and I'll cite it multiple times, Mi Mikhail Fiedrowitz writes, quote, in order to understand the essence and meaning of a sacred language, it is important to be aware that language has multiple functions. First, it is a medium of communication that allows for the transmission of thoughts or information. Here, intelligibility is vital. Beyond this, however, language is a form of expression. By means of language, man can give expression to his feelings and experiences, even his entire being. Thus, for example, singing a song does not convey information, but rather expresses sentiments, creates an atmosphere, and brings about fellowship. Considered from the standpoint of linguistics, prayer belongs more to the realm of expression than to that of communication. This applies not only to personal prayer, but also to collective prayer. Insofar as the sacred language in the liturgy is primarily directed toward God, it does not especially aim at imparting information in the sense of human communication. Here, the language serves rather as a bridge between the profane world and the transcendent God. The sacred language, as a simultaneously human and stylized speech, seeks to create an atmosphere that both reflects and evokes a certain religious attitude in those who pray." Unquote. To the extent that there is a definite content to be communicated, the use of Latin is by no means an insuperable barrier to comprehension. As Dr. Joseph Shaw explains, quote, neither the inaudibility nor the use of Latin in practice creates a barrier of understanding between the worshiper and the liturgy, since members of the congregation can consult a hand missile, 
printout, or smartphone to see exactly what is being said, translated into a wide variety of languages. It does, on the other hand, that is the use of Latin, mark off the liturgy as something special and distinct from ordinary life. When we enter into the Latin zone, so to speak, we are entering into a spiritual space. In this way, Latin powerfully reinforces the atmosphere created by the architecture and fittings of a church building, the special vestments worn by the clergy, the distinct type of music appropriate to the mass, and so on. The Latin of the mass was never in truth the language of the street or of the public speaker. Not only is it often flowery and poetic, but it is strongly marked by the influence of Greek and Hebrew and makes extensive use of repetition and deliberate archaicism. It was always intended to be what it is, a distinct holy language to be used only in the liturgy. Shaw continues, one does not have to understand the Latin text word by word as it is spoken to perceive and be moved by the solemn character with which it clothes the liturgy. The meaning of the text can be immediately available to the worshiper in printed form, but the impression made by the form of the text, the fact that it is proclaimed in an ancient sacred language of unique grandeur and gravity is also of considerable value." Unquote. Today, of course, is the Vigil of Pentecost. Pentecost is a feast so great in the eyes of the church that it was celebrated for eight days, that is, as an octave, in the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, going back to the late sixth century, a custom that continues today wherever the ancient form of the Roman rite is used. Pentecost, for us who use the traditional missal, is an eight-day feast. It's not just a one-day feast. <clears throat> A friend once told me he had expressed his love of the traditional Latin mass to a certain deacon, a diocesan deacon, who countered in a huff. Pentecost shows that the apostles spoke to everyone in their own language, and it wasn't Latin. This liturgical misinterpretation of Pentecost and the gift of tongues, which one hears now and again in different forms, deserves a response, especially on the, on the eve of Pentecost. What the Acts of the Apostles shows is that the Apostles preached, preached to the people in many languages. There is nothing in the Pentecost story about worship in the temple or synagogue, or the Eucharistic liturgy and the divine office that developed out of them and supplanted them. And as far as I know, it's always been the custom to preach in the vernacular at Latin masses, except in highly specialized academic contexts. The gift of tongues is a gift for the sake of evangelization, apologetics, and catechesis, not specifically for liturgical worship. Moreover, it's always worthwhile to point out that as useful as preaching is, the church developed over the centuries many other modes of expression that proved to be as effective or even more effective in evangelizing peoples. Let me offer you an example. In a book called Truth in Many Tongues, a very fitting name for a book on this occasion, Daniel Wasserman Soler studies how missionaries made use of pagan vernacular languages in the 16th century Spanish Empire. The author states, quote, we must leave behind a widespread modern assumption made famous in the Protestant Reformation that the written and spoken word constitutes the fundamental and best way for people to learn about religion. The first bishops of Mexico City, Guatemala, and Ox Oaxaca indicated to King Charles I that sermons may not have been the key to the conversion of the American natives. These bishops wrote, we confirm your majesty that the natives are edified very much by devoted services, ceremonies, and ornate artwork, perhaps even more than by sermons. Thus, in the minds of many clerics, the combination of vivid artwork, the fragrant smell of incense, the sense of inclusion in a community, and the example of a pious Christ-like clergy together could prove a more powerful force for religious conversion than preaching alone." Unquote. In a way, it is perfectly obvious once you state it 
But there are so many people today who, in the grip of an unconscious rationalism, do not recognize how much is conveyed through nonverbal language, as well as through the emotional and supra-rational elements of language itself. Language is never merely language. Its cultural history, the traits and associations of classic works composed in it, the very sound of it falling on the ear, all of this is born along with the language and often delivers as much impact as, or even a greater impact than, its conceptual content. The moment we hear, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti, amen, intro ibo ar altari dei, we are immediately placed in a different zone. It's almost like when the angel takes up the prophet Habakkuk by the hair of his head, this is uh, in the book of Daniel, and carries him off to Babylon, except that it's the opposite direction. The worshiper is carried from, the Babylon, from Babylon to the Holy Land, from the Valley of Tears to the Holy of Holies. Observes Fiedrowitz, quote, here the church also proves to possess a thorough understanding of human nature, as in this way she helps her faithful to detach themselves from their everyday language, where each word recalls profane realities, and to feel even sensibly that holy other sought by all piety. The sacred language spreads a delicate veil over the truths of the faith, which protects the holy mystery and eludes hasty comprehension comprehensibility. A language that is not commonly understood suggests to the faithful that they stand before a mystery that eludes total transparency. In contrast, vernacular language counterfeits an understanding that is absolutely not real. I just want to repeat that last sentence. Vernacular language counterfeits an understanding that is absolutely not real." Unquote. In the past 60 years of liturgical reform and abuse, far too much emphasis has been placed on the vernacular, as in a particular language spoken by a group of people, as if it is somehow the magic key to participation. But for one thing, any vernacular immediately excludes everyone who does not speak it. And that includes people who speak a lower register of the language, so people who are just learning it, as well as that forgotten group whose education equips them to grasp higher registers as more appropriate in worship and who will be vexed by translations into flat, dull, gray, modern tones. What the reformers seem to have forgotten is that there is a universal non-verbal vernacular accessible to all mankind, the language of symbols. Be they colors, actions, sounds, smells, or other religious signs, this vocabulary has an immediate, although at times perplexing, effect on the consciousness. It shows us reverence without talking about it. It shows us mourning or rejoicing without spelling it out in trite or laborious words. Let me give you an example. A black chasuble, unbleached candles, a catafalque, and the repeated refrain, requiem eternam, instantly tells us more about the meaning of a liturgy for the dead than a hundred books written on the subject. Yes, liturgical Latin is strange in the sense that it is not something everyday, familiar, easy, at our level or at our disposal. It evokes the transcendence and majesty of God, the universality of his kingdom, the age-old depths of the faith. Over time, we identify this set-apart language as a sign of honor. We experience it as a promoter of reverence, and we find in it an invitation to personal prayer. When we dive into a pool, a swimming pool, the moment we hit the water, we know, not just intellectually, but physically, viscerally, that we are in a new medium and we must sink or swim. So too, when we hear the Latin chant, or the Latin recited prayers, we know we are in a new medium and we must pray. So in fact, it's a, a, a kind of a non-intellectual experience when you hear, when you hear these various um, 
uh, sacred signs or you encounter them, right? It, it, it reminds you of where you are and what you're doing at a level deeper than, than something that's taking place merely rationally. So far from being a peculiar custom of the Western church, the custom of employing a sacred language in religious rites is already prominent in salvation history, as Joseph Shaw points out. Quote, the tradition of Gregorian chant goes back to the temple in Jerusalem, where we are told professional singers were employed. The use of Latin recalls the use of Hebrew as a sacred language, when the language of the Jewish people had become Aramaic. That was their vernacular. The traditional liturgy's emphasis on priest, altar, and sacrifice is redolent of the atmosphere of ancient Jewish worship, something sometimes noted by Jewish converts to Catholicism. As Jews, the apostles were brought up to pray and sing the Psalms in Hebrew, as well as in their mother tongue of Aramaic. No word of criticism of sacred languages is to be found in scripture in either testament. And the earliest liturgies were by no means composed in the language of the street. In Greek speaking areas, the church was able to employ the sacred register created by the Septuagint translation of the Bible, a distinct form of Greek already two centuries old and filled with Hebraisms. Latin liturgy did not emerge until Latin translations of the Bible had created something equivalent. And when it did, we find a liturgy in a sacred Latin with a specialized vocabulary, replete with archaicisms, loan words, and other peculiarities. Similarly, liturgical Coptic is an archaic language larded with Greek terms and written in Greek letters. As for Church Slavonic and the language of the Glagolithic Missal, their origins in history are not reducible to the simple idea of the language in use at the time. And in any case, they quickly become liturgical languages for people who no longer speak them or understand them. They remain culturally connected to the peoples they serve, but not readily comprehensible by them." Unquote. So we see, in fact, that every ancient Christian church developed a, sac a sacral language and idiom for worship. The Greek Orthodox Church still uses Koine Greek. The Russians use Church Slavonic. The Ethiopians use Gaez. The Copts use literary Cop Coptic, etc. I'm talking about to this day. The fact that some Eastern Christians have adapted to a modern vernacular is an historical anomaly that should, not, that should by no means be taken as normative, even if we do not need to condemn it either. The Eastern Christian sphere has always seen far more linguistic diversity than the Western sphere, which remained stalwartly committed to Latin for over 1,600 years a longer time with a single language for worship than can be found in any other religious tradition except for the use of Hebrew by the Jews and the use of Greek by the Greek Orthodox. It is hardly surprising that a belief grew up that the three great sacred languages are Hebrew, Greek, and Latin on the basis of the threefold inscription that Pontius Pilate placed above the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, the use of a special set-apart sacred language for religious actions goes well beyond the borders even of Judaism and apostolic Christianity, as Fiedrowitz explains. Quote, the phenomenon of a sacred language is found in all religions. Such a language was used by the Greek oracles of ancient times and can be found in ancient Roman pagan prayers whose formulas date back to a distant antiquity occasionally having become unintelligible even to the priest himself, though still used in order to remain true to ancestral tradition. At the time of Christ, the Jews used the language of Old Hebraic for their services, though it was incomprehensible to the people. In the synagogues, only the readings and a few prayers relating to them were written in the mother tongue of Aramaic. The great established prayer texts were recited in Hebrew. Although Christ adamantly attacked the formalism of the Pharisees in other respects, he never questioned this practice of praying in Hebrew. Insofar as the Passover meal was primarily celebrated with Hebrew prayers, the Last Supper was also characterized by the use of a sacred language. That's a very interesting point. 
It is therefore possible that Christ spoke the words of Eucharistic consecration in the Hebrew lingua sacra. Other world, other world religions also recognize sacred languages that differ from everyday idioms. The Muslims use classical Arabic for their prayers. The Buddhists employ Pali and the Hindus Sanskrit. Even within Christianity, various dedicated languages of worship have developed. Thus, the Orthodox Greeks celebrate their liturgy in ancient Greek and the Russians in church Slavonic. In addition, there is the use of Armenian, Coptic, and Syrian. Though originally these languages were certainly living vernacular languages, over the course of time they grew ever more distant from everyday speech and finally assumed the character of proper languages of worship. Even Anglican services use the melodious Elizabethan English found in the Book of Common Prayer." Unquote. This remarkable unanimity of practice across thousands of years and across every continent and culture, even those furthest removed from one another with no contact until much more recently, indicates a profound common awareness that wells up from human nature confronted by the evidence of an ultimate divine source of reality or an invisible spiritual dimension of reality to which we must relate in a different way than we relate with one another in the business or pleasures of everyday ordinary life. Fiedrowitz puts his finger on the underlying reason. Quote, if sacred languages existed in numerous cultures in almost all epochs of history and still continue to exist, this fact is an expression of a fundamental human need. In the background stands a particular religious experience that shapes and changes speech and language. It is the experience of something supernatural, divine, transcendent, and wholly other to which man seeks to respond by using a language that differentiate, differentiates itself from the form of everyday speech by means of a sacred stylization. Herein lies the origin of the so-called hieratic or priestly languages. Far from creating a, a, a language barrier, the sacred language calls to mind that religion has something else to say to man. The sacred language prevents man from dragging the divine down to his own level and instead lifts man up to the divine, which it does not, however, reveal and expose completely to the human understanding, but instead indicates as a mystery." Unquote. The same author, Fiedrowitz, himself a priest and a master of Latin and Greek classics and a professor of patristic thought, goes on to identify what he calls the characteristics of a sacred language. He, he, he points out four of them. First, a conscious distancing from the words of colloquial language, which makes the complete otherness of the divine felt. The second is an archaicizing or at least conservative tendency to favor antiquated expressions and adhere to certain speech forms from centuries ago as is well suited for the worship of an eternal and unchanging God. Third, the use of foreign words that evoke religious associations, as for example, the Hebrew and Aramaic forms of the words Alleluia, Sabaoth, Hosanna, Amen, Maranatha in the Greek books of the New Testament. So these words are not Greek, but they show up in the Greek New Testament because of their sacral associations. And finally, fourth, Syntactic and phonetic stylizations, for example, parallelisms, alliterations, rhymes, and rhythmic sentence endings that clearly structure the train of thought are memorable and allow for easy recollection and strive for tonal beauty. Tonal beauty. We will understand better why Latin is the correct and fitting language of Roman Catholic liturgy if we begin with the truth everyone knows from experience. Any time a language is spoken, it is spoken in what linguists call a register. I, I mentioned that word earlier, but now I'm going to define it. This means a level of formality, polish, or sophistication, ranging from rough, casual, or slangish at the lower end to intricately wrought poetic diction at the higher end. 
Individuals, all of us, can use their native language in various registers, depending on circumstances and education. Analogously, we may say that languages as such present themselves in different registers. So I'll explain what I mean by that. At the lowest level are slang and pigeon, pigeons. A pigeon, not the bird, of course. A pigeon is defined as a grammatically simplified means of communication that develops between two or more groups that do not have a language in common. Typically, its vocabulary and grammar are limited and often drawn from several languages. Higher up are ordinary vernaculars. A notable difference at this stage is that linguistic expectations are significantly higher in regard to usage, pronunciation, grammar, style, and so on. What people can get away with in slang or in pidgin is not allowed in many everyday contexts. We expect more, you might say. Higher up still are so-called prestige languages. Of course, these are native languages for some people, but they are chosen as second or third languages by many others due to their outstanding reputation. French has been a prestige language for over a thousand years. For many centuries, Latin was a prestige language in Europe, as classical Greek was for the Romans. Note that linguistic expectations are here are even higher, as these languages are supposed to be a sign of education, culture, and urbanity. A 19th century Russian spoke French to show that he was cosmopolitan and upper crust. This is why you get characters in the novels of Tolstoy always breaking out into French. Higher up still, and with the highest level of expectations, are reserved languages. The examples that come to mind were all prestige languages at one time, and now their use is almost entirely for religious purposes. I've mentioned these before. Hebrew, classical Greek, Latin, Syriac, Old Church Slavonic, and outside of Christianity, Sanskrit, Quranic, Arabic, Pali. These languages are revered because they are languages in which certain believers express their reverence. They have become reserved to, or at any rate, specially associated with sacred contexts. One may also distinguish between a lingua franca and a prestige language. A lingua franca is adopted by speakers of other languages as a common means of communication for practical reasons, as when an Italian and a Japanese do business in English. But a prestige language is studied in addition for reasons of culture. One might, in other words, choose to study a prestige language even when there is no practical need to do so. Since reserved languages always come from the ranks of prestige languages, they are not used simply for reasons of practicality. In short, the lower registers of language tend to be more practical in nature, while the higher registers are more cultural, ceremonial, and numinous, having to do with the divine. Language is not merely a matter of practical communication. It is also an embodiment of thought and a work of art, a very high expression of our rationality, spirituality, and transcendence. People do not write poetry, for example, just for practical reasons. There are much easier ways of communicating. Part of what makes a prestigious language prestigious is the depth, subtlety, and amplitude of expression found in it, owing to its rich history. And this is even more true of reserved languages, which, having been prayed with for centuries or even millennia, are saturated with sacral associations. The language has, in a sense, fused with the action, the rite, the content. It has itself become a symbol supporting and adorning other symbols. Having grasped these distinctions, we see that the transition of Latin from being a vernacular to being a prestige language to becoming finally a reserved language is a natural progression paralleled by other languages in a phenomenon seen throughout the world and throughout history. Now, when a sacred language is, or sorry, when a sacred liturgy is already conducted in a reserved language, any change from it is necessarily going to be a step down, linguistically speaking perhaps a big step down, 
as we would normally be looking at vernacularization, which is a lower register. Not only will a great deal of the conceptual content of the reserved language be lost, but its entire ethos, atmosphere, resonance, symbolic association, and consecrated status will be lost as well. One ends up losing far more than a language. One loses a culture, a psychological space, a spiritual environment, an entire world with its historical rootedness and its unique qualities and powerful assets. So one might ask, um, well, the, you know, these ideas are interesting, but what does the church say about this? Does the church say anything about language? Well, uh, it does. It's striking to consider what the Roman pontiffs have taught on the subject of Latin. In 1922, Pope Pius XI wrote, the church of its very nature requires a language that is universal, immutable, and non-vernacular. In 1947, Pope Pius XII stated in his encyclical Mediator Dei, the use of the Latin language customary in a considerable portion of the church is a manifest and beautiful sign of unity as well as an effective antidote for any, cor any corruption of doctrinal truth. In 1962, right on the eve of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII promulgated solemnly an apostolic constitution, Veterum Sapientia, in defense of Latin as the proper language for Latin rite church studies, documents, and liturgy. He says, quote, the church's language must be not only universal, but also immutable. Modern languages are liable to change, and no single one of them is superior to others in authority. Thus, if the truths of the Catholic Church were entrusted to an unspecified number of them, modern languages, the meaning of these truths, varied as they are, would not be manifested to everyone with sufficient clarity and precision. There would, moreover, be no language which could serve as a common and constant norm by which to gauge the exact meaning of other renderings. But Latin is indeed such a language. It is set and unchanging. It has long since ceased to be affected by those alterations in the meaning of words which are the normal result of daily popular use. The Catholic Church has a dignity far surpassing that of every merely human society, for it was founded by Christ the Lord. It is altogether fitting, therefore, that the language it uses should be noble, majestic, and non-vernacular. In addition, the Latin language can be called truly Catholic, it has been consecrated through constant use by the apostolic see, the mother and teacher of all churches, and must be esteemed a treasure of incomparable worth. The employment of Latin has recently been contested in many quarters, says John XXIII, and many are asking what the mind of the apostolic see is in this matter. We have therefore decided to issue the timely directives contained in this document so as to ensure that the ancient and uninterrupted use of Latin be maintained and, where necessary, restored." Unquote. So that was John the 23rd, October 1962. <clears throat> it deserves mention that this constitution Veterum Sapientia, although ignored by the progressives and modernists and even after a while by the conservatives, was never rescinded or contradicted by later popes in any document of comparable status. The universal truths it contains remain no less true in spite of the unwillingness of churchmen to implement its practical policies, just as the universal truths contained in the Modu Proprio Sumorum Pontificum remain true regardless of the practical efforts of Pope Francis or Archbishop Roach to suppress the traditional liturgy of the Roman Church. Truths are true. We might be tempted to rush past the claim made by Pius XII and John XXIII that the use of Latin safeguards orthodoxy, but it deserves a moment's attention. They are referring, of course, to the traditional Latin formulas used in the liturgy, in the Vulgate, in the Western Fathers of the Church, in the canons and decrees of ecumenical councils, in canon law, and in other magisterial documents. This body of Latin teaching is astonishingly unified and consistent across centuries. 
Anyone who knows Latin well can pick up almost any Latin text from a period of over 2,000 years and understand it. This record of continuous worldwide use of a single stable language is practically unique in human history and supports what these popes are claiming on its behalf. I'm going to come back to that point later. The translation of liturgical books into the vernacular languages, hundreds of them, has, on the other hand, demonstrated the claim negatively. We are drowning in examples of dumbed down translations, of erroneous and theologically problematic translations, and constant fights over the register of language to be used in official translations. The awful version of the Bible inflicted on American Catholics, the New American Bible, isn't even written in proper English. As Anthony Eslin says, it's written in Nabish, N-A-B, Nabish. Whether one is talking about doctrinal texts or liturgical texts, the vernacular tends to be a nonstop headache, earache, and heartache. Latin is a crucial part of Catholic tradition, not alongside it, but within it. Indeed, it is that by which tra tradition was transmitted in the Western world. It is part of the way God has provided for his church. Even if modern people all agreed that Latin should be abolished completely, it would not cease to be part of tradition. This is an unarguable and unchangeable fact. We might compare it to, the, to priestly celibacy. The ecclesiastical law that a priest cannot marry derives from tradition. Nowadays, many so-called experts say they know, quote unquote, that celibacy is responsible for low numbers of priests. Next to priesthood for women, celibacy is a favorite target for modernists, and every modern Catholic is supposed to be opposed to it. Yet it is part of our tradition and as such irreversible. Latin is very similar to celibacy in this regard. While it is used in the liturgy not by divine law but by church law, it is nevertheless part of tradition, as are Greek, Slavonic, Syriac, Armenian, etc. for the Eastern churches, and should therefore be preserved regardless of our personal modern opinions. We should not subordinate tradition to our personal opinions. We should learn why tradition is the way it is. The error, the error that led to the abolition of Latin was neo-scholastic and Cartesian in nature, namely the belief that the content of the Catholic faith is not embodied or incarnate, but somehow abstracted from matter, like free floating. Thus, many Catholics think that tradition means only some conceptual content that is passed down, irrespective of the way in which it is passed down. But this is not true. Latin is itself one of the things passed down by tradition, together with the content of all that is written or chanted in Latin. Moreover, as we have seen, the church herself recognized this point on a number of occasions in singling out Latin for special praise, recognizing in it an efficacious sign of the unity, Catholicity, antiquity, and permanence of the Latin church. Latin thus possesses a quasi-sacramental function. Just as Gregorian chant is the musical icon of Roman Catholicism, so is Latin its linguistic icon. Liturgical reformers in the grip of rationalism treated Latin like a mere accident, as if it were the dispensable packaging of a product. In reality, it is more like the skin of a person. The skin is superficial in the, in the literal meaning of the word, right? Superficial is on the surface. But if you take the skin away, the result will be an ugly mess. Which brings me to Vatican II and the Novus Ordo. <clears throat> I don't know, that wasn't very subtle, was it? <laughs> Many Catholics throughout the world, including apparently bishops and cardinals, seem to be unaware that the teaching of Pius XI, Pius XII, John XXIII, and other popes was deliberately echoed and confirmed by the Second Vatican Council's Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacra Sanctum Concilium, which says, quote, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites, unquote. 
It says, moreover, quote, steps should be taken so that the faithful may also be able to say or to sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the mass which pertain to them, unquote. And again, quote, in accordance with the centuries old tradition of the Latin rites, the Latin language is to be retained by clerics in the divine office, unquote. Those are, if you want to know, those are sections 36, 54, and 101. The council did open the door to a greater use of vernacular, which by the way had been done prior to the council as well, but it did not mandate the vernacular, and it certainly did not mandate the complete vernacularization of the liturgy. Clearly the constitution was passed by a huge majority of bishops, something like 2,107 bishops to four, right? It was a landslide. Only because the bishops had been reassured again and again that there would be a moderate reform, not a revolution. Contrary to the claims of Pope Francis, most of the bishops at the Second Vatican Council, if you study their speeches, the speeches they gave during the council, actually supported the retention of Latin, which is why they voted for it in the final document, as I just quoted. I wrote an article about this that quotes extensively from the Council Fathers. We know now, thanks to the careful research of historians like Yves Chiron, that Bugnini, Annabale Bugnini, who spearheaded the writing of Sacrosanctum Concilium, had already before the council began successfully colluded with his teammates to execute just such a revolution once the council had ended and in a Machiavellian manner, counseled the use of vague, ambiguous, open-ended language with plenty of loopholes that could be exploited later on, which is exactly what happened. So while Vatican II officially reaffirmed Latin in the liturgy and, and Gregorian chant, and made a cautious opening to some use of the vernacular, especially in instructional parts of the mass, so-called, what came afterward with Paul VI's support neutralized or neutered it. And Paul VI's departure from both tradition and the council has never been opposed by any of his successors. This is one of the reasons why Latin will never reappear in any significant way in the Novus Ordo. Paul VI waved goodbye to it, and only traditionalists who adhere to the preconciliar liturgy have dared to question his good judgment in undertaking a wholesale reinvention of the Catholic Church's divine worship. The Novus Ordo was created for maximum intelligibility or comprehensibility, maximum ease of understanding. It was supposed to remove every possible barrier to the comprehension of the faithful. They are supposed to see, hear, and know everything that is being said and done at every moment, instantly and without preparation or reflection. Now, this lecture is not the occasion for me to explain what is wrong with this model or the presumption behind it, but suffice it to say that never in the entire history of apostolic Christianity, East or West, and never in the history of world religions has this been the way anyone has ever thought about divine worship. In any case, if such immediate and total transparency is the goal to be sought, everything is going to have to be simplified, put into the common language, and made visible and audible. Thus, the priest will be turned to face the people, he will have a microphone, there will not be much silence, only one thing will happen at a time, etc. If this is your paradigm for worship, then it's rather obvious that Latin and Gregorian chant too will have no place in it, at least for 99% of congregations. So when somebody like Cardinal Supic or anybody says, well, you know, you can have the Novus Ordo in Latin, they're, they're completely missing the point. The Novus Ordo in Latin falls between two stools, to use a saying of Joseph Shaw's. It has neither the instant accessibility for which it was designed, nor the grandeur, solemnity, symbolic richness, and ceremonial depth of the Tridentine Rite, which augments our awareness of mystery and our receptivity to truths that cannot be put into simple linguistic packages. So the Latin Novus Ordo fails. It fails from both angles, right? In short, Latin befits the old mass 
like stained glass befits a Gothic cathedral, or gold befits a chalice, or silence befits the Roman canon. It does not work with the design principles of the new mass. The accessibility of the Novus Ordo is, however, illusory or deceptive in two ways. First, its verbal approach, which I described earlier, tricks us into thinking that we have understood or that we are capable of comprehending divine worship and the mysteries of Christ. Because its mode of active participation is very much on the surface, about voices and bodies in motion, we can easily pass through an entire such liturgy without having once pondered or interiorly prayed, without having suffered wonder, bewilderment, or awe. This is not a problem the Latin Mass has, in which there are frequent and diverse provocations to the acts of prayer, and where the intended participation is more of the heart and the mind. Second, it is accessible, it, that is the, the Novus Ordo, is accessible only to those who speak a given vernacular language and who can hear it and follow it. In a multicultural world and with factors like inadequate elocution, poor sound systems, or ambient noise, the curse of Babel can quickly fall down upon us. Now, I'd like to focus on this point for a moment, the curse of, of Babel. Father Louis Bouillet pointed out, quote, every religious tradition represents language as a gift of the gods that makes society possible and continues to hold it together like a thread. Conversely, Genesis sees in the fragmentation of speech into mutually incomprehensible languages a curse from heaven upon a sinful society, unquote. The first Christian Pentecost, nine days after our Lord ascended into heaven, is presented in the Acts of the Apostles as a reversal of the Tower of Babel. The original curse upon ambitious man was to divide his progeny into a thousand languages. Even if the rich poetic fruits of multiple languages can be counted a blessing willed by God, the difficult the difficulty and often impossibility of common discourse among rational animals is unquestionably a curse. Any, any, anyone who travels extensively has encountered this curse. This curse is renewed whenever we are confronted with a liturgy in which the use of some vernacular that is foreign to us effectively says, this is not for you, it's only for them, for that demographic. When liturgical traditions develop a common language of public worship, it is a symbolic return to the pre-lapsarian condition of the Garden of Eden, when human beings would have spoken only one language. In the Latin liturgy, we are not confronted with a foreign vernacular that excludes us. Rather, we hear the sound of a single voice that belongs to the church at prayer, welcoming all nations and peoples into one celebration. In some dioceses, the Novus Ordo Mass can be found celebrated in 15 different languages, and each language group is an island unto itself, hardly mixing with the other groups. But there are multi-ethnic and multilingual Latin Mass parishes where the Mass itself is truly the unifying force for all the subgroups, bringing them together in fraternal relations and allowing them to mingle socially as well. How many of us have been to a Latin mass and seen whites, blacks, Asians, Hispanics, various ethnicities and nationalities all gathered in one act of Catholic, that is universal worship? As John the 23rd pointed out, Latin belongs equally to everyone and to no one in particular. It's not the language of an empire anymore. The Roman Empire is gone, right? It's not like English, right? Which is sort of the modern imperial language. The Latin language in history has always been an ethnically and culturally integrating force. It continues to build those bridges today. I had a potent experience of this not long ago when visiting Poland for a conference. That was last November. In spite of my surname, which is as Polish as pierogi and kielbasa, I hardly speak a word of Polish, which is widely considered a very difficult language to learn. 
For days I had been surrounded with unintelligible noises to which everyone else could respond and I could not. Thankfully, the conference provided me with earphones broadcasting a simultaneous English translation. It was rather awkward though. I was the only non-Polish speaker out of hundreds of people. So they had hired this translator just for me. So I felt really awkward whenever I wanted to like leave the conference for a few minutes. It was like, anyway, but it kind of kept me in my seat the whole time. You know? One morning on my visit, I walked with a group of friends to Wawel Castle, one of the most beautiful and historic places in the city of Krakow, to reach the side chapel where low mass would be offered by a priest of the priestly fraternity of St. Peter. We arrived just as mass was starting. The comforting words of the Latin fell like a refreshing rain on my ears or like a ray of light piercing the impenetrable fog of the foreign language of the country outside. We were in God's country now. The priest said the mass deliberately and with an easily audible voice so that I missed not a single word. I didn't have my missal with me, but it was very easy to follow along. Sadly, due to the clumsy and illicit provisions of Traditiones Custodes, the lesson and gospel were given only in Polish, which suddenly plunged me back into the fog of unintelligibility and reminded me of how the vernacular not only includes the locals, but excludes the stranger. It was the only part of the mass that lost its world embracing Catholicity in favor of a narrow localization. At the conclusion of the gospel, the server said, Laus tibi Christe, and all was well again. The remainder of mass alternated between moments of Latin that bobbed up above the surface of silence and the enveloping quiet in which the word became flesh anew, as it were, upon the altar in the power of his incarnation, passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. That mass in the Vavil side chapel was a perfect experience of the liturgy as synchronic and diachronic, synchronic, because I felt instantly and immediately at home in the very same liturgy said all across the world wherever tradition is treasured. An experience I've now had dozens of times on my travels in foreign countries. And diachronic because this was substantially the same liturgy that had always been said on most of the altars of Christendom in the West for centuries. Alcuin of Charlemagne's court St. Anselm of Canterbury, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Edmund Campion, St. Charles Borromeo, St. John Vianney, St. Vincent de Paul, St. Padre Pio, St. Charles de Foucault, all would have been at home in that Vavil side chapel. With the traditional Latin mass across the ages and across the world, one is always at home. The miracle that, for some sacred moments at least, undoes the chaos of Babel demands the strong stability and inner coherence of the great Roman liturgy, whose language gives to Latin Rite Catholics their very name, right? We are Latin Rite Catholics. Our native language, our mother tongue, comes from our earthly mother. When we are living inside her womb, her voice is the first we hear, and when we come forth into the world, we hear the same voice upon her breast. Our everyday vernacular is something we are, in a sense, equipped with by nature, by effortless immersion in the family culture. This language represents the natural order in which we live and move and have our natural being. Now, even as baptism or rebirth comes to the Christian from outside, for as Joseph Ratzinger writes, nobody is born a Christian, not even in a Christian world and of Christian parents. Being Christian can only ever happen as a new birth. Being Christian begins with baptism, which is death and resurrection, not with biological birth. So too, the sacral language in which we worship comes to us from outside, from Holy Mother Church, who teaches us a new Christian language a spiritual mother tongue, which represents the supernatural order in which we live and move and have our supernatural being. Latin Rite Catholics have a sacred language that comes to them from outside, just as baptismal rebirth does. 
The Christian liturgy should somehow convey to us that when we enter the Lord's temple, we are speaking not with a merely natural speech, but with a supernatural speech, a language of saints, angels, and God. Obviously, this language does not have to be Latin. As noted above, there are many sacral languages used in traditional apostolic rites. But it should not be the everyday vernacular of the hearth and the marketplace, or even the technical speech of academic disciplines. It should be set apart by centuries of use consecrated to divine worship. In this way, it helps worshipers to set aside earthly cares and consecrate symbolic portions of their time to God alone. A traditional liturgical language is a reminder that our supernatural adoption into the family of God is more fundamental and more ultimate than any earthly family, citizenship, nation, or race. Most importantly, something the Catholic Church in the West has practiced for over 1,600 years, something that nearly all of our thousands of canonized saints personally practiced, cannot be condemned without denying that the Holy Spirit has been guiding the church into the fullness of truth. The Holy Spirit who gave linguistic utterance to the apostles as they preached to all the nations also gave liturgical Latin to the Western church as her inheritance, handed down from century to century with ever increasing veneration. What was established by choice was confirmed by custom and preserved by piety. The forms of worship developed over centuries with a richness of content and texture that made it increasingly unlikely that it could ever be readily duplicated in or adapted to a foreign idiom. This made it all the more precious and worthy of cultivation. Against the backdrop of experiments in vernacularization from the mid 20th century onward, experiments that could be called with more justice, babelization, an ever-increasing number are coming to see that this unique and unitive Latin heritage remains precious and worthy of cultivation today. Nor should we overlook the crucial fact that no modern vernacular is capable of conveying all that is contained in the traditional Latin prayers. Every translation is a betrayal, as the old saying goes. All the more so when we are looking at a vast treasury of over 16 centuries of liturgical Latin. A hand missile can give the gist of the content fairly well, but the Latin prayer says more, says it better, more subtly and fully and strikingly. Does this make a difference? By all means. The one we are principally addressing is God, and how we address him matters. When we offer him solemn, beautiful, highly valued, and saint-spoken prayer, it is pleasing in the way that an unblemished lamb is pleasing, in the way that the unblemished logos offered on the cross was pleasing. The very fact that countless holy men and women had the very same words on their lips over the centuries endows them with a special efficacy. Saint Mechtild of Hackeborn, I don't expect you to have heard of her, she was a medieval German mystic. Saint Mechtild of Hackeborn says that the court of heaven rejoices whenever it hears the same words it prayed while on earth. So just a few concluding thoughts. One way we can see the fallout of the abandonment of Latin is to consider the intellectual and theological effects. The vast majority of Western Christian writings in all areas, theology, exegesis, canon law, liturgy, hagiography, etc., was composed in Latin, and the vast majority of this literature has still not been translated, and probably never will. There's too much of it. I, I once heard a talk where somebody said, they, they, this Latin teacher, this expert said, you know, something like, if you filled up um, you know, uh, a, a gymnasium the size of a football field, you know, with back-to-back -back books in all of the books that were written in Latin, basically, that we have still in possession, the number of ones translated would, would cover something like 100 feet. You know, it would be a tiny, a tiny portion of that huge amount. The radical progressives who waged war against Latin in the mid-20th century knew very well what they were doing. 
They wanted to blow up the bridge that connected Catholics with their heritage, their tradition, their collective memory. Sorry if that sounds like a conspiracy theory. The vaunted modernization of the church could be carried out only if the past were forgotten, sealed inaccessibly behind a wall of incomprehensibility. The loss of Latin has therefore had ramifications far beyond the sanctuaries of our churches, even if that is where we most notice its presence or absence. Heresy thrives on a combination of amnesia, anarchy, and novelty. The liturgical crisis is only one part of the larger crisis of Catholic identity, which has more to do with language than most people realize. I, I would just simply say, there is no, the Latin Rite Church is a church whose entire heritage is in Latin, okay? Except for the tip of the iceberg from 1965 or so onwards. Following on this point, I think it's important for Catholics to realize that all of us should learn some Latin. It does not lose its historic role, special character, and sacred function if we do understand it as a language. Mystery is not the same as mystification. When I understand the Latin of the liturgy, it doesn't make it any less wonderful. On the contrary, one's appreciation grows because one can savor its meaning and beauty. This is not necessary for fruitful worship. I hope I've made that clear but it is a real advantage and one that we should care to acquire. Latin was once a standard subject for all Catholic students, as difficult as it is to believe that now. And many individuals learned it to a high degree, even those who did not become priests or religious. If we care about our tradition and our heritage, we will make sure this language is included in our homeschool and private school curricula. Recall for a moment that Hebrew was a dead language until the Zionist movement and the state of Israel revived it as a spoken language. Today, millions are fluent in what was a, what was a dead language 150 years ago. How embar uh, I should also mention, Muslims study classical Arabic because they value their heritage. How embarrassing, how shameful it would be if Catholics cared far less than Jews and Muslims for a heritage that is immeasurably truer, better, and more glorious than that of either the Jews or the Muslims. Was that a politically incorrect statement? <laughs> if anyone is to blame for this abysmal state of affairs, it is not you. It is the hierarchy of the church. Shepherds who, contrary to their divine vocations, did not faithfully hand on the tradition that was given to them, and who have barely lifted a finger to correct a catastrophic cultural collapse. Practically speaking, it is not difficult to acquire some rudimentary facility with the Latin language as used in the liturgy. Simply by assisting regularly at mass and other ceremonies and using a hand missile, I mean, especially if you get a hand missile that has the Latin as well, that's, I always recommend that. Don't get one that just has English. Get one that has the Latin and the English. We will begin to pick up a rough and ready knowledge of vocabulary. Let's be honest. The Gloria and the Credo are not hard to follow. We say them over and over again. They even have lots of words that are similar to English words. The more zealous could pick up a good Latin instructional book or enroll in an online course. Happily, there are already a good many people out there who are reviving the language, including in its spoken form. I don't know the, uh, the latest estimate, but I, I think I read that there are something like 10,000 people in the world who are fluent in Latin at this point. It's not a very large number, uh, but it beats Esperanto. <laughs> I mean, it, I don't know if it beats it numerically, but it's just a better language. <laughs> It should go without saying that children, above all, ought to learn Latin, since language acquisition is, generally speaking, much easier for children than it is for adults. Singing Gregorian chant, while whether informally at home or as part of, I'm sorry, whether informally at home or as part of a choir, is an important and enjoyable way to gain some acquaintance with the treasury of ecclesiastical Latin. I recommend, for example, singing the seasonal Marian antiphons at home as part of evening devotions. 
you know what I'm talking about. The, the Alma Redemptoris Mater, the Salve Regina, the Ave Regina Caelorum, and the Regina Caeli. These are the four seasonal Marian antiphons. Children pick them up in like three days. I mean, this is what I've seen. They, and they don't understand what they're singing, but that doesn't matter at all. They'll figure it out eventually, right? It, these, everything takes time. Every good thing takes time. Uh, we, we want instant results. That's a, to a huge mistake in pedagogy. There's no such thing as instant results. What we want is to plant seeds that will blossom 10, 20, 30 years later. Right? That's what education should do. We must not be afraid to assert boldly that it is good and fitting and optimal to use Latin for the sacred liturgy, that is, the solemn, public, formal, official worship of the Roman Catholic Church. The reasons for its use are so numerous and overwhelming. The substance and authority of tradition are so unanswerable that there is no way to escape the conclusion that retaining Latin is a serious obligation before God and abandoning it is a serious deviation from his liturgical providence. In the midst of cultural diversity, the Catholic Church had the wisdom to recognize the spiritual power of central elements of unity that bring us together in confessing the one true faith and paying homage to the most holy trinity. We can hope and pray that our church leaders will, over time, take steps to recover what was foolishly squandered in short-sighted reforms. We, for our part, are able to show our gratitude to God by retaining and promoting the sound traditions of the Latin church. Thank you for your kind attention. Did I see a question already? Yes, sir. Yes. On the internet within the last week, someone claimed that Pope Francis approved in the Orient or Malabar Church that they could face east during their service at Orient. Yes. Uh, is this, do you know if this is true and would this be a glimmer of hope for people who want things restored to what they were? Yeah, so, well, okay, so yes, it's true, and no, it's not a glimmer of hope, uh, at least as far as, as this current pope is concerned. And the reason is that, that it's been, how far back do I go? Um, it, it's, it's been fashionable for many decades now for Western liturgists to fall over themselves in admiration for the Eastern churches and the Eastern rites. Right? They're always praising the beauty of the divine liturgy and all oh, the smells and bells and it's so wonderful. All the Eastern Catholics should restore their own traditions, but then they hate their own Western tradition. Right? It, it's the weirdest thing. It's a kind of bipolar phenomenon. You know, uh, almost, it's almost like the more they adulate the East, the more they reject the Western traditions. It's, it's a rather bizarre psychological phenomenon. And so what the Pope has done is he said to this, the Syro Malabar church, it's a church in India, a, a rite in India, their tradition, like everybody else's, including the West's, was to celebrate the mass, the divine liturgy, ad orientem, for, towards the East, uh, which is something that St. Basil the Great in the fourth century says is an apostolic custom. He says it's as ancient as, as, as uh, worshiping the, 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 the Holy Spirit, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and, but the Syro-Malabar rite, under, under the influence of Western liturgists, started to say their mass versus populum, okay? And finally, in the Syro, and the, so, so there's been a fight in the Syro-Malabar church, and finally the Vatican actually put its foot down and said, no, you have to follow your own tradition. You have to do at least the Eucharistic part of the liturgy ad orientem, right? Uh, so that is true. Um, but, but of course, if you look at you know, someone like Cardinal Supic, who enjoys the uh, support of the Pope. Um, he tried to forbid priests from celebrating Ad Orientem in Chicago, even though the rubrics of the new Missal allow for Mass to be celebrated Ad Orientem towards the East. So, uh, so it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a really a chaotic situation right now. Yeah. Question on the Latin. Um, you made several references to liturgical Latin. Um, going forward, um, if 
Latin is to be used. Do we not need to be um, cautious about what that idiom is? I'm thinking here of introductions of classical Latin, such as Baeus Psalter and the very bizarre Latin translation of the Book of Common Prayer used in certain colleges at Oxford. It just sounds strange. Yes, so <clears throat> there are different, I, I mentioned in my lecture that Latin is a language, it, it's, it's somewhat unique in the sense that there is enough consistency in the use of Latin, in its grammar and vocabulary, that somebody who reaches a high enough level will have open to him about 2,000 years worth of literature. That's not something you can say about other languages, at least not, not nearly to the same extent. Um, so, but, but within that realm, of course, there are many different varieties of Latin, if you will. I mean, there's the strict classical Latin of Cicero, which is considered, you know, he's considered the model of rhetorical ancient pagan Roman uh, Latin. Then you have the Christian Latin of someone like St. Gregory the Great, or St. Leo the Great, or St. Augustine, which of course is very polished, very eloquent, very high level, um, but it's not the same as Cicero. It's already been Christianized. It already shows the effect of Greek and Hebrew. There are other influences on it. It's not just Ciceronian, right? Then you have medieval Latin in various forms. Um, and medieval Latin has its own richness to it. That's one of the great things that's happened in the past, I would say, maybe 50, 60 years is that there used to be this attitude coming from the Renaissance classicists, the Renaissance humanists. They looked down upon medieval Latin. They called it barbaric because they, their, their standard was Cicero, um, maybe, uh, or maybe the, some of the church fathers as well, but mostly Cicero. Um, and yet the more that people study medieval Latin, the more we appreciate its own poetic beauty, its own richness. It's very rich uh, as well. It's just a different type of Latin. It's a different dialect, as it were, of Latin. Um, so I think you know, the language of the Tridentine Mass is mostly in that patristic, um, patristic high Latin. Um, it's, it, there is, of course, medieval Latin, like in the sequences. Um, you, can find, you can find different types of Latin. All of these things are the kind of Latin that seminarians, clergy, children in, in good school programs should be learning. Uh, not so much Ciceronian pagan Latin. I mean, that's not a bad thing. And if somebody has an aptitude for the language, then they could certainly study that as well and you know, increase their, their scope. But if our goal as Catholics is to understand our own Latin literature and liturgy and poetry, you know, I, there are books that are more aimed at that angle, that come at it from that angle. Is that, is that the kind of thing you were wondering about? Yeah. Yes. In your lecture, you mentioned the guidance of the Holy Spirit um, to eventually lead the Roman Church to use Latin. Um, how would you respond to those who would, ask, who would like ask about how about like 99% of Roman churches now are using like the vernacular? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So of course, the, you know the the um, the argument the argument about liturgical providence basically takes the following form: any practice that the church has embraced over a very long period of time, with the approval of the saints and the popes, is something that we should take seriously as what God wanted for the church, um, and so. If there's suddenly a change that goes in a very different direction, and if the reasons for the change are dubious or even problematic, which they are in this case, uh, then, then it looks more like human beings being unfaithful to providential indications, rather than God suddenly changing his mind, as it were, and saying, well, you know what? After 1,600 years of liturgy done this way, now we're going to do it a totally different way. Um, now, is it, is it intrinsically impossible that God could want such a change? No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I don't think you could say it's intrinsically impossible, but it's not the way the church has ever thought about liturgy, ever. That, that is, the church is, when I say the church, I mean everyone in the church, everyone who spoke for the church prior to the Second Vatican Council, and really all the way up to the Second Vatican Council's discussions, would have said it is a positive gift from God to have stability in the liturgy, to have 
consistency, to have the same prayers on our lips that our forefathers prayed, um, it, to keep the traditions. This was always seen as a positive thing, not as a negative thing. Pope Francis, I'm not trying to pick on him too much <laughs> in particular, but, but Pope Francis has an almost entirely negative attitude about tradition. Whenever he uses the word tradition, it's like a bad word, you know? Uh, and, and that to me, it, it's so obvious that that's a profoundly un-Catholic attitude. All you have to do is read uh, what St. Thomas says about tradition. He says that someone would sin by celebrating the liturgy in a way other than is customary in the church. And he's saying that about all these sorts of topics. Um, even more revealing is St. Vincent of Lorenz in the fifth century. He, he just goes on for page after page after page about you should never do anything novel. You should only do what people have already been doing. And he, he makes this practically uh, you know, dogmatic. Uh, and he gives very good arguments for it. And you can find this sort of thing all over the place. So it would be very strange if something that was unanimously venerated and agreed upon for nearly all of the church's history would suddenly be deemed harmful, obscuring, interfering, um, et cetera, and in need of, of massive overhaul. That's just never happened in the history of the church. Uh, and so that's why I think traditionalists are rightly skeptical about that, you know? That, that looks like hijacking, not, uh, not someone being especially faithful to a new prophetic mission, you know? So. How, how would you explain the hostility or the indifference of so much of the hierarchy to the last mass over the last 60 years? And I'm not just talking about the regime at the Vatican right now. I'm talking about even uh, the better half of the bishops and, and cardinals who, who seem to prefer the, uh, the Novus Ordo, um, even if they are indulgent towards the Latin Mass? Yeah. Well, so it's a good question. Um, I think we have to distinguish between the current bishops, who almost all of whom were formed already at a time when liturgy was changing quite a bit and whose whole life experience has been, in a sense, immersed in, litur in the Reformed liturgy, um, such that they may not have a very good perspective on the tradition. And often, in my experience, and I have had a lot of experience with bishops, um, even the ones who are the most sympathetic to us, they don't have a very good training in liturgical theology, so they don't actually understand a lot of these things. But the more interesting question is, why did all the bishops who signed Sacrosanctum Concilium saying we should keep Latin, we should keep Gregorian chant, we should have moderate reforms, why did all of them suddenly go along, you know, only less than 10 years later with such a radical overhaul, right? And I think there are two reasons, two basic reasons. The first reason is that nearly everyone in the church for the past 150 years has been in the grip of an error that I call hyperpapalism. Okay, this is, this is a, a, a kind of term of art. Um, some people say ultramontanism, uh, and, and that, that's a more familiar term, except that it has a little bit more historical baggage to it. But hyperpapalism is basically the attitude that whatever the Pope says and does is what we should all do, is the best thing to do, is the right thing to do, and no questions about it, okay? Uh, so basically the Pope is an absolute monarch whose will is law. That's, that's a, maybe a nutshell description of hyperpapalism. And no less a person than, than Joseph Ratzinger said, this is a false idea, this is erroneous. The Pope is not an absolute monarch whose will is law. He is actually the guardian, the recipient, and the guardian and defender of tradition. So that's his job. He shouldn't be changing everything. He should be protecting everything from innovation. Uh, so if, if your bishops are all thinking, well, whatever the Pope commands us to do, we all have to do, we have no question of the matter. You know, it's just obedience. Um, then that's, that's going to account for things changing overnight if the Pope makes up his mind to do that. The other factor, though, is, is just the cultural confusion and chaos of the 1960s. And the fact that, you know, liturgy was in such a chaotic condition from, a, from the mid-1960s onwards that in a sense, the bishops were begging the Vatican to do something to stabilize the liturgy. Uh, anything, do anything, just give us, just put an end to this reform and give us something definite to do. And so when the Novus Ordo finally came out in 1969, 
for a lot of bishops, it was kind of a life raft that they held on to. Okay, like maybe we wouldn't have done this, but at least we know definitely what we're supposed to do now. Um, so I think you put this whole, th all, this whole thing together. It's the perfect storm, which by the way is the name of episode two of Mass of the Ages, a perfect storm. So I, I, recommend, I can't recommend too highly watching that episode because it really gives you a great uh, overview of what happened in the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, around the year 300 plus AD, the Emperor Constantine, in his authority as a civil official, convened the Council of Nicaea, if I'm correct. And then I believe the Holy Roman Emperor, later in history, held kind of a, a, an analogous authority parallel to the church and civil affairs. Yes. Is there any contemporary civil authority. I don't know the president of France or you know, who, who has a similar prestige in this, in this time yeah. that he could say, listen, we need to convene the church and get this solved. Yes. I wish there were, actually. Uh, you know, it's interesting, in the history of the church, until really until about the first Vatican Council, at least uh, symbolically, we could take 1870 as a date, there were very powerful secular social forces. Uh, I shouldn't say secular, because that might have the wrong con connotation. There were very powerful lay forces in the church, aristocrats, monarchs, associations of different kinds, that actually had a certain weight in ecclesiastical politics. And the pope and the bishops couldn't just do whatever they felt like doing, because there was a kind of um, mutual network of rights and responsibilities, of obligations and expectations, where people kind of kept each other in balance. It was a kind of checks and balances system, right? Americans didn't invent that. That's been around for a long time in the Catholic Church. And as the Catholic Church lost influence in civil society, as monarchies were overthrown or became figureheads, as aristocrats became figureheads and impoverished, um, you know, as great abbeys declined, right? Abbots had a huge amount of authority once upon a time. As all these things declined, what happened? The prestige and authority of the papacy went up and up and up it, as a kind of compensation for that. And it was useful. It was useful to have a pope in the 19th century who could rally all Christians around Rome and around traditional doctrine, right? Because that's what popes used to do. They used to rally people around traditional doctrine, you know. Um, and so that was useful, but it was dangerous. It set up a dangerous precedent. There, there is actually a great scholar who's written about this. Her name is uh, Bronwyn McShay, Bronwyn McShay. And she wrote this wonderful article in First Things Magazine just a few years ago that if you're interested in this subject, I cannot possibly recommend it too highly. It's, to, it's an article called Bishops Unbound. And it just tells the story of how bishops came to have more and more power concentrated in their hands with no checks and balances. So this is a problem. I have no idea what this, how the solution is going to come about, but there has to be a solution somehow. This is not a healthy situation. One argument I've heard against the traditional, uh, traditionalist way of understanding the liturgy and its development is that the Western Church's decision to discontinue the distribution of Holy Communion in the chalice is like proof that the magisterium can just get rid of the tradition. Well, how would you respond to that? Right. So actually, I wrote an article about this um, where I pointed out that if, if the purpose of the Eucharistic liturgy is to, to prepare us properly for receiving our Lord Jesus Christ by purification, by supplication, by uh, adoration especially, and then to give thanks worthily for that gift, it doesn't actually matter all that much whether you're receiving our Lord under one species or two species or whether you're receiving him with leavened or unleavened bread. Those are incidentals when it comes to the main point of, of receiving the Lord. Um, I mean, we all know dogmatically that we're not receiving any less of Christ if we receive only the host as opposed to the host in the chalice. Whereas if a liturgy were changed in such a way that, that the effect of it was a weakening 
of contrition, a weakening of interior life, a weakening of adoration and reverence towards the Blessed Sacrament, etc., then we would know that that's a very bad kind of change. That's a, that, is, that is going against the very purpose of the Eucharistic liturgy at that point. Yes. Yeah, no, it's a good question. The question is, like, what exactly is the Mass a tool for evangeliz evangelization or not? Because you hear things said both ways. I think the simple answer is that the church's worship is not in itself for evangelization. It's for worship. It's to worship God. The, ob the object of it is God, and the, that's the primary object. The secondary object is our sanctification. Um, so the liturgy is not itself supposed to be primarily instructive, catechetical, apologetic, evangelistic. However, liturgy, if it's done beautifully and well, will have a power of evangelizing. Um, it, it has that somewhat like an aura, right? <laughs> that is, if, if somebody who is in search of God and who is sensitive to beauty walks into the Brompton Oratory and sees a solemn high mass and hears Palestrina and smells the incense and so on, is caught up with that experience, that person might actually have a, a conversion experience at that point. And then the mass has missionized him, but not because it intended to do so, but as an epiphenomenon, as, as something that kind of falls out from doing it well. And this example I'm giving, by the way, is not, not fictitious. There's a, there's a man named David Clayton who relates that his conversion began by walking in randomly to the Brompton Oratory one day into a high mass and, and having this, this transcendent experience of beauty that made him start searching into religion and eventually he converted to the Catholic Church, right? Um, and I've heard plenty of stories to, enough to know that that happens. Whereas I think all of us have sometimes had that cringy experience when a mass is pandering too much to the people. Like when, when the focus, like the priest is trying to connect with the people and, he, and especially if it's like a, a younger group and you've got an older priest, he's trying to be hip with the young, I mean, it's such a cringy thing, you know? Uh, and, and that's because at that point, suddenly the, it's been forgotten that the mass isn't about the congregation. Um, if that priest had turned around and worshiped God intently and zealously, it might have actually moved the people in the church in a deeper way, right? Because he's now modeling for them what they should be doing. And then you have a kind of master-apprentice relationship. Right? Yeah. Um, given uh, just the richness, for those of us who are English speakers, the richness of the vernacular tradition, whether it's the Book of Common Prayer with Cranmer and Coverdale, we have the Anglo-Catholic Knot Missal, Matthew's Old Catholic Missal, all these prior, older English translations that are in a, a hieratic English, a, a reserve register, as you refer to it. Were we not, uh, would you agree that we English speakers were particularly abused in the 1960s and 70s by the translations that we were given, yes. since they completely ignored our own native yes. tradition? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, though. The, the question of English in the liturgy, so you might think, you might think, we have Shakespeare, we have the Coverdale Psalter, we have the Anglican uh, Book of Common Prayer, we have so many great models of lofty, poetic English. Why couldn't the Tridentine Mass, and, and even the Tridentine Mass was translated into that kind of English in the 19th century, why couldn't we have used that kind of English when the mass went to the vernacular? Well, the, the answer is actually that, that the many, many converts from Anglicanism to Catholicism would have pitched a huge fit if that ever happened because those things are all permeated with Anglicanism. So, the, so for the Anglican converts, in many cases, what they wanted was the Latin liturgy. They wanted something other than the Protestant background or the, well, Sometimes they don't like to use the word Protestant, but the Protestant slash Anglican background from which they came. And in general, it seems to me true that the great English religious literature is not Catholic. It's from schismatics. It's even from heretics. So this is a problem for us. Actually, it creates a tension now with using that English. Now, perhaps you're thinking, what do you think about the Anglican ordinariate, right? I, I think that the Anglican ordinariate is a beautiful thing for former Anglicans. 
I don't see it as sort of a way forward for the entire English speaking church. That would be a very strange detour for us. That's not our tradition. We weren't Anglicans. We're Roman Catholics. We're part of the Latin Rite. That's our heritage, right? Um, so I think it's good to have the Anglican ordinariate, but I think it's always going to be a very small, um, like, like a side stream, not the main river uh, of, of Catholic worship. But yeah, certainly our, we were treated very badly with the translations. The original ISIL translation of the early 1970s was one of the worst in any language, into any vernacular language. I mean, just to give you a great example, this is the way it was all the way until 2011. The, the Roman canon says um, that, uh, it, it says literally, our Lord took this precious chalice into his holy and venerable hands. That's what the Roman canon says. The ISIL translation of the 70s said, he took the cup. That's all it said for that whole phrase, okay? So when you have this kind of dumbed down uh, text, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just, it was a form of, of linguistic abuse. Yeah. Yes. I have two questions. The first is, what, uh, which translation of the Bible do you recommend? And then the second one is, um, in terms of like, everything that's happening with the restrictions and limiting you know, the new parishes that can even begin um, having that mass celebrated. What action steps would you say that we could take other than attending Latin Mass ourselves? Uh, what can we do to kind of move this preservation of tradition? Yes. Yes, okay, so the first question is, uh, what English translation of the Bible would I recommend? Well, I don't recommend the New American Bible, just to start, <laughs> just to start there. Um, and, and actually, uh, well, so, I think St. Augustine says in his treatise De Doctrina Christiana that the best thing we can do is to read scriptures in the original languages. Now, I can't, I can't read Hebrew. Um, I, can, I can only read a little bit of Greek, um, and my Latin is decent. Uh, but he says if you can't read the original, then you should have multiple translations because no one of them is ever going to be adequate, and I touched on that in my lecture. Um, and so there, there I think, the, you know, if somebody's going to do serious study uh, or, or wants to write about scripture, then you really have to look at a few translations. But if you're just looking for devotional purposes, um, it seems to me that a good thing to do is to look for an older version that has a more lofty language, like, like, uh, like we were you know, hearing about earlier. Um, and, uh, and, and there, I think, I mean, my personal uh, favorite for devotional reading is something called the American Standard Version, the ASV. Um, which I just, I find it very eloquent, but also very readable. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't feel clunkily archaic, but it's, it doesn't feel like just like contemporary English, like some of these like jazzy Bibles that, you know, are published nowadays that try to make everything sound like, you know, the, like today's news, newspaper or something. Um, so yeah, the, the, Americans, the American Standard Version, the English Standard Version, some people really like that. I think there's something called the Augustine Bible now published by the Augustine Institute, I think is, is the one publishing it. So the ESV, the ASV, the RSV from Ignatius Press, the Revised Standard Version, all of these ESV, ASV, RSV, as the name kind of, uh, as the um, abbreviation suggests, they all come from the King James Version. So they're in the King James tradition. And that is the great English translation of the Bible. Um, I would only say the Catholics should have a copy of the Douay Reims as well because the Douay Reims is much more faithful to the Vulgate, which is our kind of in-house Latin translation. And it's the only translation, it's the only translation of scripture into any language that is known to be free from error in faith and morals because the Council of Trent declared it so. Any other translation into any other language in the world could have errors in it. Er and I don't mean just linguistic errors, but I mean like theological errors, right? So it's good to have the Douay Reims um, what are you saying? What, what's the name of the book? The Douay Reims? Yeah, the Douay Reims. It, it's still in print. In fact, I heard from Tan Books that they sell 44,000 copies every year. So I, I thought, that's a lot of copies of the Douay Reims Bible. Who are these 44,000 people? You know, 144,000 people. Oh, no, never. No, that's the apocalypse. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but the thing about the Douay Reims is that it's, 
it, it's, it's what's going to match, for example, the readings at the Tridentine Mass most closely. So if your Missal gives a certain reading and you want to go and read around that passage, the Douay Reims is a really good version to use. Its English is a little bit stiffer and more awkward than the King James tradition. And so that's why I, I, I kind of, I'm saying like it's good to have both the Douay Reims and one of these um, standard versions. I, that was a complicated answer, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> um, but then you also asked what, what can we do given the incre increasing attacks on, on tradition? And the first thing of course we can do is just to be patient because I think that we can all recognize that we are looking at really predominantly the flailings and wailings of of a dying breed, uh, the, that is to say the Vatican II nostalgics. Okay? There aren't that many Vatican II nostalgics left um, and, and almost nobody from younger generations shares their enthusiasm for, um, you know, basically everything, all the things that they're enthusiastic about are all of the things that have led to either mediocrity or decline. And they don't see that because they're ideologically committed to it. Um, just like communists, don't see that communism destroys countries and economies. They don't see it, but everybody else around them can see it. <laughs> you know? And so I think, I think if, if we, the, 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 the um, analogy I would make is, as Bolsheviks are to the Soviet Union, so are the Vatican II nostalgics to the, uh, the current campaign against tradition. Um, and I, I think it's just bound to fail. And, and a sign that it's, it's, it's going to fail is that most bishops are just too practically minded to want to kick over and over again the hornet's nest. Not, uh, not that I'm comparing you to hornets, but they, 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 don't want to, they don't want to kick perfectly good and faithful Catholics in their own diocese who are going to mass, who are having children, who are yielding vocations to the church, who are contributing generously financially, all these sorts of things. So we just have to keep being, ex we have to try to be exemplary Catholics so that bishops will say, those exemplary Catholics, you know, they love the Latin mass. Well, we're not gonna take that away from them. You know? So in some dioceses, this will go fine. In others, it's gonna, go, it's gonna be a hard period. Um, but perseverance, patience, perseverance. Be ready for action if you need to. So if, I don't think, it, from, what I can from what I've heard, I don't think it's going to happen in, in Cleveland, but, but in, 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 in places like Washington, D.C., the, Catholic, the Catholics are really terrified that the, the Cardinal Archbishop is gonna pull, is gonna, there are, I think, seven places that have the Latin Mass in Washington, D.C. right now, and the rumor is that the bishop is going to group them all in one place, and the one place he was going to group them in was going to be someplace really inconvenient, you know, like, like in the 70s when Masses were put into, like, mausoleum, like, cemetery chapels and things like that, you know, or like, like the insane asylum chapel or whatever. Um, <laughs> And so, but, but there's been so much pushback to the Cardinal Archbishop in DC from his priests and from the faithful that uh, the, the expected res, um, release of this, of this document keeps getting delayed again and again because nobody, I mean, they're not letting him rest. They're basically just telling him this is going to be a huge mistake if you do this. And they're all ready to mobilize if he actually does it then he's, he's gonna get like a bag of mail every day, you know, and until, um, until something changes. So I guess I would say pray and be ready for action in that way too. I don't think it's useless to write a letter to a bishop as long as it's respectful, saying how much the Latin Mass means to you and how much it's brought you closer to our Lord. They need to hear this. Whether they listen or not, at least you're discharging your conscience, your, your, consci your, your duty. Do you see any connection or relationship between the, the faith or the vicissitudes of Latin within the church and the faith or vicissitudes of Latin outside of the church in secular education? <clears throat> yes, for sure. Um, there is, undoubtedly, there has been a general, how shall I put this, a loss of respect and a kind of skepticism towards cultural traditions that has afflicted, we all know this, that has afflicted the Western world for many decades now. Certainly the, in the 1960s, it erupted in a volcanic way, but it was already operative um, from the 19th century at least. And so if you, it's very interesting. If you look at the teaching of Latin, it declines both in the secular sphere and in the ecclesiastical sphere. I don't know if it declines at the same time or at the same rate, but it's, it's a cultural phenomenon. The cultural phenomenon is, 
is what's been called by some philosophers presentism. That is, thinking that the only thing that's important is the present moment, or futurism, that the future is the only important thing, but that the past is its passé, its um, benighted, its baggage. We need to give up the past. That kind of cancel culture mentality is what we're dealing with here in the church and in the secular world. Right? Um, so that's why, I mean, I, I think, you know, as Catholics, we should also stretch our minds and try to think about other ways in which we can be countercultural. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't go out of our way. We shouldn't try to make ourselves completely strange either. But, but I mean, something like, you know, uh, like the quality of the music we listen to or the quality of the movies we watch or the quality of the clothing we wear, the, you know, there are ways in which we can, like the whole, it seems to me the whole of Western culture is becoming sort of more barbaric all the time. That's just clear. It's not even hard to, you know, it's hard to deny that. And so we could try in certain ways to push against that because we have to. I mean, we, we should, I think, for our own sort of self-respect, you know, and, our, and, and respect for our culture and our traditions. So, yeah. Yes? To comment on the fact that um, I really appreciated um, your description of um, the use of the language, it doesn't need to be understood. And the reason I'm sharing that is, you know, I, I'm, I was born in '66, grew up with the New Mets, and um, I thought, you know, my mom and dad go to Latin mass here and there. They would say this because mom just wanted to go. We had no idea what that was about. My son started going, and you know, he invited me to come along. And I, I, was, so, I was so overwhelmed, because I had no idea what was going on. And, you know, I'm 55 years old, and like, I think you know what's going on. What's going on? Where are we in book? Like, you know, like that. And so he, and I talked to him, he was like, just be there. Yeah. You know, come Yes. You know, and this was a couple years ago. And, you know, so then I made this deal with him, like, we would go every other week. So I, and that gradually, as I began sing with that, like I began understanding what he was saying. Like when I was able to just like let it go to me, and now I know what's happening. Yes. 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 You know, um, exactly. and I have my whistle now. And um, but I think that's really important. And one of the things that I, that I would find concerned about. I think you're just how many people every night who don't always know a lot of mass. Like, you know, how do you get that? How do you, I would love to take everything you said and just like be able to share that. Because it really, to me, who, like my children, my other children, who, you know, they, I'll say, you know, well, Sean and I are going to let mass, and I'm going to go, not really, yeah. you know? Because that's just, you know, when you have that culture. Yeah. I do think that, I do think that. Um, with, I mean, obviously God can work in mysterious ways and he can hit people over the head and he can do what he did to St. Paul and knock him off his horse. Um, but I think for most people, there has to be some kind of hunger for something more that either that or just a curiosity, like a personality that's curious, that, um, that likes to explore new things or is willing to explore new things. But if, if there's an, I've met Catholics, for example, who have said, you know, especially converts, who say, I was attending the Novus Ordo for a long time, but I kind of had this feeling that there had to be something more. Like, this didn't seem quite to do it, you know? I, and it's hard to put that into words, what exactly is going on there, but I think there's some awareness that the way in which the liturgy is being conducted is inferior to what it's supposed to be. It, it, it's, it's not worthy of, of the message that it's supposed to deliver. There's some kind of disconnect between the way it's being done and what is supposed to be being done, if I can put it that way. Um, and, and so, or, or even just to use the tradition, there's a, there's a discrepancy between the Lex Arandi and the Lex Credendi, the, the way you're praying and the things you say you believe. Um, and so when there's that, there's that sense of incompleteness or, or longing for more, then such a person is really ripe for the encounter with the traditional liturgy, I would say. Um, but if a person isn't ripe for that, you know, if, if, you, if you brought them to the Latin Mass, especially to a low mass, uh, they, they might just 
sit there kind of fiddling, you know, twiddling their thumbs for half an hour and not get any, you know, not have any, uh, not get anything out of it at all and not even be, think, oh, wow, that's amazing, you know. Um, so this is why I always say if you're going to bring somebody to a Latin mass, you should probably bring them to a high mass. <laughs> There's just a lot more going on and a lot more to see and to hear and to, you know, it's, it's a more multi-sensory experience, you know. Low mass is sort of like Lexio Divina, lit liturgical prayer, you know, liturgical silent prayer. It's, it's, it takes, I think, a certain maturity. Although, again, for somebody who loves silence, it's, you know, they're going to they're gonna fall in love with that instantly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is it, there was just something else on, the, on my mind about this. Um, Ah, oh, it's okay. Yes, there's a question from over here. Yeah, if the church had a uh, change of heart, how would you imagine that they would uh, uh, move everyone who grew up with uh, the, the new mass uh, towards the lab? Oh, because okay. you couldn't just get rid of it. Like, how would you do it in reverse? And it could increase today uh, within the current uh, uh, environment or something. This is like write your own fantasy. Okay, I like this. Uh, so, anyway, no. Um, I mean, I, 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 do think, I do think it may very well happen. I don't know how long it, it would take, but perhaps 20 years from now, 40 years from now, I'm not sure, that there will come a time when there will need to be an indult given for the Novus Ordo. That is to say, uh, that if, if current trajectories continue in Western countries, Africa and Asia are a different phenomena. I mean, I, one would have to think about them differently. But in Europe and in, and in the Americas, if the current trajectories continue, the churches will rapidly empty out. The Novus Ordo churches are rapidly empty, emptying out. Um, we might not think that because we can think of a Novus Ordo parish that's packed, but the number of dioceses where churches are closing one after the next um, and where just the numbers of people seeking the sacraments are plummeting, um, I just don't think it's going to take that long before the, the, the energy and zeal that's in the traditional movement will actually become, in a sense, dominant. That is, it's the, it's the dominant dynamic force in the church right now. Um, and so there may come a day when, uh, when the popes have to say, well, you know, the normative liturgy is the traditional Latin liturgy, but for those who, are, who have some attachment to the vernacular liturgy, then there's an indult for them that can be permitted on the second Sunday of the month at 3.30 p.m. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, maybe we can stop on that note there. <laughs> but I will, okay, I'll be back at the back if you want to. <laughs>